first uh, thank uh, Pastor Keith, who filled in for me last Sunday as he uh, gave a great message walking through that passage in Joel. Uh, but if you remember, uh, two weeks ago, I kicked off a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and I shared that these three chapters of Scripture here in Matthew 5 through 7 is kind of Jesus' introduction to his new way of life, uh, to a new way to, to be human. And he talks about as his, his kingdom right here, where the good and right rule and reign of God is most experienced and felt and realized. And so the Sermon on the Mount is kind of his introduction to his administration. It's kind of like his inaugural address. Uh, he says that he's bringing this a new administration in, this new kingdom, a new set of values that replace the old kingdom, the old way of doing things. Now Jesus is here to replace the old kingdom of this world with the new kingdom of God. And so we're finally going to get into the Sermon on the Mount uh, this morning, as we did a, a little bit in Matthew 4 two weeks ago. Uh, but our chapter, our passage this morning, is Matthew 5, uh, verses 1 through 12. Uh, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. So feel free to pull them up on uh, your smartphone or open up a Bible uh, of course, we have uh, what we call sermon notes in your bulletins that have that same passage in there as well out of the NIV, uh, which is what I typically preach from, and we'll also have it on the screen too. But however you get there, it's always good to have uh, those words of Scripture right in front of you. And in this section of Scripture that we're looking at this morning, uh, Jesus gives us some of the values and characteristics that he will teach and prioritize throughout his entire ministry. And so we're going to get started right with it. Uh, here with verse 1. We're going to read the whole passage uh, together to get started. So starting at verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. Well, these ideas right here in these 12 verses, they continue to get unpacked throughout the rest of Jesus' ministry. Now, he'll tell parables about these characteristics. He'll challenge those people who don't live these things out. Uh, he'll draw near to those who do possess uh, these specific characteristics. Of course, he himself, he perfectly embodies them and eventually he gives his life as a substitute for you and me who fall short in every single way of these characteristics. And he also will send his spirit to empower us to live into them as well. Again, this, is, this list right here, this is a, is a condensed list of the sort of community that he came to create and of the, the types of people of whom his kingdom is especially good news for. So it's actually, it's possible to do a whole sermon on each one of these uh, Beatitudes. Uh, I've seen 13, 14 week ser series on this. I'm going to try to do all one today. So uh, I was also told by Ryan that I can't preach as long as I normally do because we had the kids sing this morning. So I'm going to try to shove it all into one little section. So, but uh, anyways, we're going to look at uh, the Beatitudes as one collective whole this morning. Uh, just some of the bigger ideas that Jesus put across in this collection of statements that he makes. These blessings that he talks about. As I'm sure that you notice that the theme of Jesus' teaching here is the blessed life. About what it means to live the blessed life. Uh, he uses the word uh, blessed nine times in just these 12 verses. And this section of scripture, like I said before, is often called the Beatitudes because of the Latin word for blessed or happy. Uh, the Greek word for blessed is makario, makarios, which literally means happy. Makar is the Greek word for happy. 
It kind of means it's the state of well-being. It corresponds to the Hebrew word shalom, which we talked a lot about two weeks ago, which is that right relationship with God, with others, with self, and with the rest of creation. So all those ideas are involved with this idea of the blessed life or the happy life. Again, there's a, a lot of different English words that we could use here. Uh, we could use the, the word happy, that Jesus has talked about happiness. You know, how to be happy and how God's kingdom changes what we otherwise tend to think of as the way to happiness. We could say that he's talking about joy or that he's uh, talking about contentment or he's talking about uh, the good life. Uh, there are nuances to all those English words, and some people love to debate that happiness is different from joy, and I feel like I've touched on that before in our flipping series a few months ago. But today, I just want to dodge all that discussion, simply say that Jesus is talking about all of that stuff. Uh, he's talking about the state of well-being, whatever you want it to be, whatever word that you use. The blessed life is the life that you want. He's talking about a sense of rightness and feeling okayness of life. The, the state of well-being that you and I both want for our lives today. He's saying, because of my coming and the kingdom of God being brought to bear on this earth, that this is what the good life looks like. This is what happiness looks like. This is what joy actually looks like. This is the blessed life here. This, that's the big idea of these 12 verses. So let's think about it like this. What would you say are the ingredients for the good life? What would you say are the ingredients for a good life? If you were to ask the typical person this question, what do you think would be the, the answer? You know, what would you need to be happy? Based on how we talk and how we act and think, what would that answer be? What would you say are the ingredients for a good life? I think most people would say for a good full life that you would need love, that you need acceptance and approval, uh, friendship, uh, a group to belong to. Uh, I feel like most people would say that maybe you would e need enough money. You know, maybe it's being rich or maybe just having enough so you, you don't have to worry about money anymore. It's just some level of material comfort. Maybe it would be the ability to do what I want when I want to. Like, you know, I'd say we, you need some measure of power and control in your life. You know, maybe some freedom to be able to act and live as you'd like, to, that you can't have other people controlling you. I think many people would say, in however many words, that you have to love yourself, that you need to accept yourself, or you need to have a positive self-view or, or good self-esteem. I think many people would say that you have to prioritize your own happiness, or other folks would say, that, uh, you know, you have to do something about uh, making a difference in people's lives. Or people would say that romantic and sexual fulfillment is mandatory for happiness or to, to live the good life. And I think many people would tie happiness into that certain quality of life where overall there's health and there's stability and circumstances are favorable. And these are a lot of the times when I see pictures on social media where it's saying someone's living the blessed life, uh, that they're, you know, usually a body of water, a beach, or a nice lake, or you know, they have a, a nice drink in front of them, and they're, they're with a group of loved ones, whether family or friends. You know, circumstances have to be good to be living the blessed life. In other words, if a typical person put together their own list of uh, beatitudes, it would sound more like this. You know, blessed are the rich, for they can do what they want. Blessed are you when you accept yourself, for you will find inner peace. Blessed are the sexually and romantically fulfilled, for there is no other path to joy. Blessed are those who believe in themselves, for they will accomplish their goals. Blessed are the influencers and people who are very put together. And blessed are those who are rising in their careers no matter the cost. You know, if you look, these things tend to be what teachers and self-hope folks uh, talk about and they sell. It's this idea of, you know, helping you accomplish the, these beatitudes, uh, how to accumulate wealth, how to be a better leader and an influencer, you know, how to make friends and influence people, how to do self-care and prioritize yourself, be proud of who you are and where you come from and what you're capable of. And then... Along came Jesus, who basically says the exact opposite 
of all of those things that we had up on the screen. Just the complete opposite of what most people would say, their actual beliefs of what make, makes life good and what makes people happy. You know, if we weren't so familiar with this list of Beatitudes, the ones that Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 5, you know, we would basically write it off as total nonsense, wouldn't we, compared to what we actually think it means to be happy. It's so different from how most folks believe the blessed life should look like. So here's what Jesus just said in a nutshell. I want to give you just three things today, three things for us to focus on for these 12 verses. And one is that true happiness is not based on our circumstances. Uh, those two things are not linked in any actual way together. The second one is that true happiness can only be found as a, a byproduct. It's a, a byproduct of giving yourself to something more important than your own happiness. And the last one I'm going to hit on this morning is that true happiness can be found when, only be found when you realize you can't find it on your own. So we're going to look back at a few of his statements, and I'm going to show you what I mean by each one of these, these three points here this morning. So first, number one, true happiness is not based on our circumstances. You look back with me on verse number four, where Jesus says this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's saying, blessed are those who mourn, so you're grieving a negative situation right there if you're mourning. That's what mourning is. Now I'm lamenting. I'm grieving the bad circumstances that are in my life. And of course, even Jesus, he ends this passage by saying that we're blessed if people don't like us and mistreat us and say really awful things about us. Like look at verses 10 through 12. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, in other words, blessed are those who are mistreated because you are trying to do the right thing, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or verses 11 through 12, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Well, in his commentary in the book of Matthew, Frederick uh, Dale Bruner, he says this. First and literally, the Beatitudes are Jesus' surprisingly countercultural, God bless you to people in God awful situations. You know, most of us, we tend to think that happiness is found in a set of circumstances, that if this and this happens, then I'll be happy. You know, actually, our, our English word happiness comes from that same root as happening. That you are happy when what you want to happen happens, and when what you want to happen doesn't happen, you are not happy. In fact, this idea, you know, comprises many of our commercials that we see on TV. You know, you, do you experience any lack of happiness in your spirits? Well, if so, purchase, purchasing this product will solve this for you. You'll need this, this drink or this vacation. Nearly everywhere that you turn, our culture attaches the circumstances to happiness. And then there's Jesus saying, for example, happy are those who mourn, that tears are streaming down your face, yet there's joy in your soul. Well, why? How, how does that happen? Well, well, Jesus says it right here in this passage. He says, in Jesus' kingdom, I have been made right with God, so now I have a God who comforts me through these things. That's how he ends, uh, ends this. Blessed are those who are more, and they shall be comforted. Or when, when people misrepresent me, or speak evil of me, or reject me, or mistreat me, in Christ, I can still be blessed. Why? Well, Jesus said it. Great is your reward in heaven. So in Christ, the reward of having people like me is overwhelmed by the superior reward of heaven. You know, many of you have experienced uh, significant tragedy and loss and found Jesus to be absolutely right in all the things that he said. Many of you have. Many of you have experienced significant loss, yet God comforted you and blessed you in those situations. 
Well, this week uh, during VBS, uh, one of our amazing volunteers uh, shared a story that I thought was, uh, at least to me, shared a story that was a perfect example of this. Uh, she shared with me that her mother had always prayed a, a certain prayer over her, her youngest and only brother. It was a prayer that God would use him to draw people to God. A prayer that to God, asking God to use his life to bring people into relationship with, with God, with him. Well, when he was 18 years old, he was actually tragically killed in an auto accident. And as you expect, the family was rocked by this. The family was in mourning. They were grieving over the loss of their, their son, uh, their life that was cut short so prematurely. But how did God comfort this family through this? Well, since he was young and connected to a lot of people, of course, the funeral would be too large to fit in a, in a church or in a funeral home, so they had it in the local high school. And the pastor of the service, who was, was bold, and in his opportunity that morning or that afternoon that he was given to him, and he shared the gospel. And two rows of high school students stood up simultaneously to indicate that they wanted to give their lives to Jesus that day. Not only that, but 30 years later, one of those students actually told the mom of this son who passed away that his life was changed that day, and that because of her son's life and his death and that funeral, that he had been a devoted believer ever since. You know, his, his life was transformed out of that tragedy. That even in tragedy, even in what we would call horrible circumstances, God used, used it to draw people to him. You know, God is good, isn't he? And again, many of you know exactly what I'm talking about, and you experience moments like that in your life. Maybe not quite to that, that grandeur, but still you've experienced those moments in your life. You know, you'll never be freer than when you realize circumstances no longer have the power over you that they used to have. Again, those things still matter, but they're not determining factor in your happiness. You know, a Christian is somebody who can weep and still be blessed because you know a deeper joy and happiness than the circumstance that you might be mourning. So here's a question I want you to think through as we process this, this idea this morning. If, if life did not change at all for you from this moment forward, you know, your, ch your situation didn't improve, uh, your marital status didn't change, your career didn't progress, your, your body didn't feel any better at all, could you still be happy? If life did not change at all from you, for you from this moment forward, could you be happy? Because none of the things that we think we need to be happy in life actually happened to Jesus, as you think about it. In many ways, what happened to Jesus was like some people's worst fears. You know, he was never married. He never had sex. He, he never owned a home. He was abandoned by his friends. He was misunderstood and criticized. He was not in the majority power group. He was hated by the religious powers and governmental powers. He was falsely accused. He was experienced a, a false trial and executed through having done nothing wrong. You know, Jesus, he lived a God-awful life, and li he's literally the most God-blessed human who ever walked this planet. According to Jesus, happiness is not rooted in a set of circumstances, but the result of being in a right relationship with God. So that's the first thing that we learn in the Beatitudes. The second thing is that true happiness can only be found as a byproduct. It can only be found as a byproduct. Happiness is a byproduct. You can notice in these 12 verses that Jesus does not say, blessed are those who pursue blessedness. You know, he doesn't say, blessed are those who seek blessedness. He says, blessed are those who seek something else, something higher, something more worthy. Things like righteousness, or mercy, or peace. This is one of the ways that we tend to get totally wrong, just absolutely totally wrong. How often are we faced with a decision and some well-meaning person says, well, you just have to do what makes you happy. Where people say things like, you, you can't put others ahead of yourself or else they'll walk over you. Or if you let others go first, then they will begin to think that you should go last. And a hundred other ways that Jesus sees the world very differently than a modern person today. 
Jesus here says that the only way to find happiness or blessedness is to pursue other more important goals. He says, blessed are those who mercifully put others ahead of themselves. Sacrificial service to others. He says, blessed are those who do what is right, no matter how much it will cost them in the long haul. Yeah, my guess is that some of you have found that to be true as well. That there's times in your life where doing the right thing was much harder and costlier for you, but you did it anyway. And do you not look back now and say that you're glad that you did that? Is that not a deeper joy that you found by doing the, more, the harder, more challenging thing for you? I'm sure also there were times where you said, okay, you know, this thing is the right thing for me to do right now, but if I do that other thing, the not right thing, I think it's going to make me happier right now. So you chose to do that, that thing instead. And I guess that some of you, your, your most regretted moments in your life come from things just like that. Your, your own happiness is not a high enough goal to live for. And if you pursue it at all costs, it, it will actually leave you emptier. If all you do is what's best for you, then you'll never find what's best for you. If all you do is what's best for your family, then you'll never find what's best for your family. Blessedness can only be found as a byproduct of pursuing something more important. So again, that's, that's the second thing that Jesus has for us. And then number three, that true happiness can only be found when you realize you cannot find it on your own. Again, true happiness can only be found when you realize you cannot find it on your own. You know, the very first beatitude actually states this. In Matthew 5, verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So who gets the kingdom and all of its blessings? Jesus says it's the poor in spirit. You know, there's actually a, a couple of different words for, for poor in Scripture. Uh, there's one word that for, for poor that means kind of needy. That means like a living paycheck, the paycheck. Well, the other word means actually totally destitute. You know, there's no paycheck at all. It is the strongest word for poverty. And that's the word that actually Jesus uses right here. It means the, the poorest of the poor, the lowly, the, the marginalized. It means the outcast of society. It's the despised. Now actually, the, this Greek word for this is actually an onomatopoeia. The word sounds like what it represents. And so the Greek word actually sounds like you're spitting when you say it. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, or I'm going to spit all up here. Uh, but when you pronounce the Greek word that Jesus uses there, it sounds like you're spitting because that's who we're talking about here. These are people that are actually spit upon because of who they are. These are the kind of po uh, poor that Jesus is talking about. Those despise for how weak they are. So this word for poor and sp or poor in spirit means not just that you fail, but that you feel that you're a failure. It means that not just what you l that you lack, but that you feel that you lack. That you deeply understand that when you're poor in spirit, that you lack the resources in yourself to face life's challenges. And Jesus says that there's a blessing that comes with realizing this about yourself. You know, great things happen in a person's life when they realize they don't have what it takes and they turn to God for help. Allow me to give you just a, a kind of overly simplistic illustration of this. Well, the other week, uh, I was playing with, with building blocks with my son Isaac, who's two years old, and uh, there were some blocks that were stuck together that he wanted separated. So he grabs them and he fumbles around with them what seems like a, a lifetime for me. And while I'm there watching, you know, this would literally just take me two seconds to do. And finally, Isaac, he realizes that he just can't do it on his own. And he just gets upset. He, he's getting frustrated. He's getting angry that he just can't do it on his own. And he looks over at me and realizes, you know, I might be able to help. And he says, Daddy, Daddy, help. And he hands it to me, and I, I took it apart just immediately. You know, sometimes you and I are like a two-year-old child sitting beside the almighty sovereign of the universe, just trying to do something on our own strength while he is ready and waiting to move on our behalf. 
Now, of course, one of the many ways that this illustration I shared falls short is that my job as Isaac's dad, a great way to say this on Father's Day, is that to help him learn to do things for himself. My goal is to move him to where he doesn't need my help as much. But now God does not intend for you to eventually stop needing him and move out of the house at all. Our position before him, no matter how long that we've been a follower of Jesus, is a continual need and his desire for us is to to have continual help by his spirit. That we have his power at our disposal. We simply just step into our need and step into our lacking. The problem is that the kingdom of the world does not value poverty of spirit, though. That we value being strong and proud. We, we value believing in yourself. We say, you're stronger than you think. Your voice is important. Your opinion matters. Rise up. You have to love yourself. Accept yourself. So as long as you believe that your greatness comes from within, you can accomplish any dreams that you have. But then Jesus comes and he says, no. In order to belong to the kingdom of God, you first have to be poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means to say that my problems are beyond me, that I cannot save myself, that I need help. I'm not competent to deal with my own problems in life. And this is the number one requirement for entering the kingdom of God. You know, you cannot come to Jesus as if he's like some sort of self-help enrichment course. You're like, you know, I can do it. Jesus can just help me along with my life. If you're thinking my life is just lacking just a little bit of friendship, so let me see if Jesus can help, it's not going to work. If you're thinking, I basically like my life, but I do some, some sense some emptiness, and so there may be some religion or spirituality could be what I'm missing, that's not going to work. Or if I want my kids to have some moral foundation, so we're at church for them while they're young, that's not going to work out. That's not how Jesus operates. He's not going to do that for you. Jesus doesn't simply help. He saves he, he redeems, he transforms, he delivers from one kingdom to another kingdom altogether. He ushers in a reversal of the world's values. He flips everything on its head. So if you're thinking, you know, I've got to get to church or get right with God so that he'll fix all my circumstances in life, like he'll give me a spouse or a job or a ease or, or comfort in my life, then you're missing the whole point. He wants to give you himself in a way that you can handle not having any of those things in your life. You can apply this principle across everything that we do in our Christian journey. Those who feel capable on their own as parents will not experience the power of God in their parenting. Those who feel capable in their ministries or their relationships or their careers, uh, it's, it's when we depend on God and not on ourselves for provision, wisdom, power, and guidance that we we get his power. And God only fills empty hands. You know, this principle is one of the keys to the success rate of like, alcoholic anonymous and all those other support groups like that. You know, first step in all those addiction programs is this idea that we admit that we are powerless over our problems. And that's where you need to start in those type of pro programs. That I did my best I tried, and I've come to the end of my ability. I don't have what takes. You know, digging deep and believing myself wasn't enough. I need outside help in this. But you know, some of us, our biggest problem is that we're just good enough at life to convince ourselves that we are not desperate for God's help. To say another way, that we are in our, our middle class in spirit, not poor in spirit. That we need God's help only when catastrophe hits. Same as we need financial assistance only in a pandemic. Otherwise, we're fine. The truth is, when everything is fine, when you have power in your life, when you have wealth, when you're comfortable or whatever, you often don't sense any need, sort of need of God's abiding presence for you. But when we come to God to say, I don't have what it takes. I, I need your help. I've come to the end of my ability, my, my power, my strength, my resources. I'm out. Can you help me, God? That is when God accepts us who we are. And that's when God fills 
our empty hands. So my one question I want us to, uh, another question I want us to process here this morning before we close is the question of what's one thing you can do this week to practice a posture of being poor in spirit? What is one thing that you can practically do this week to move from being middle class in spirit to being poor in spirit? You see, Jesus repeatedly says, you know, I'm not here for people who think they don't need me. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sick. That's, those are the people that need a doctor. And when we come to Jesus empty-handed, we get him. That's what makes sense of all the Beatitudes that we read here this morning. That when we're poor in spirit, Jesus comes near. That when you mourn, Jesus comforts us. That when we thirst for righteousness, you know, Jesus supplies it. That when you're pure in heart, God doesn't stand against you. That when you make peace, God is a party to it. That when you're persecuted, when you're spoken ill of, when you're mistreated, Jesus is with you. Or as the psalm says, at his right hand, our pleasures are forevermore. Again, this right here is what the blessed life looks like. The blessed life in Jesus, the new kingdom. Would you join me in prayer? Well, Jesus, thank you that you came to establish the good reign and rule of God on earth. Thank you that you made the way possible for those of us who know we are failures. And God, I would pray that you would send your spirit as we process these things in our own lives so that your kingdom would be more evident in our midst. It's for your glory and for our good that we want to see this happen. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.